Hello there, YouTubers, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Cassette's Workshop. Today, the Iowa Model ADF 910. This deck, I have a full presentation of this up on my channel. In case you're interested, you're going to find the link in the video description. For some reason, it's one of the most successful videos on my channel, which is kind of weird, because I really don't consider this cassette deck to be anything special. The problem with this is, uh, I made a video a couple of months ago, and I had to find out when I tried to use this cassette deck that the belts were all bad, and there is a mechanism, obviously. There is one of the belts. This thing is absolutely loose. There is another belt connecting the two capstans. This is a dual capstan mechanism. And another belt connecting the two capstans together. That actually slipped off, because it was so loose. And then there is a third belt down in there that opens and closes a cassette door, and uh, that's not working right either. It's too loose to close the door. So, I went with the easy solution, and I ordered in a belt kit. This arrived very quickly, has the three belts in there that I'm going to need. So, yeah, it is an easy solution, but you do pay dearly for this. Three belts, 17 euro. It's absolutely ridiculous. But, oh well, at least I won't have to uh, search for belts in my replacement parts and then find out that I don't have anything that fits. Now, as we take a look at the technical side of things in this deck, uh, also in kind of a contrast to the Fisher CRWZ1 dual cassette deck that we've seen in the last episode of uh, Dr. Cassette's workshop, you can clearly see the Fisher is better. In this deck right here, we have absolutely no division between the digital, or, you know, the, the control circuitry, and the audio circuitry. It's all just kind of mixed up all together on the circuit board. The bias oscillator is right there. It's not shielded. We have this dinky little transformer, which, um, yeah, that, that could be better. That could be better. At least they bothered putting in some, uh, some metal to uh, shield this a little bit. And uh, doing this, we can also do it right there. Not impressive at all. Uh, another thing that I've uh, noticed is there is no fuse in this deck. There is no secondary fuse, there is no primary fuse. I'm probably going to modify the circuit board and insert a fuse somewhere. I don't like that. Um, as I already said, bias oscillator is right there, no shielding. We have two Dolby ICs, both made by Sony. You have to have two Dolby ICs for the monitoring. This is a three-head deck, and when you play back during record, obviously, you're going to need two Dolby ICs, because one is going to be busy with the encoding, and then you need one for decoding as well. On the front, it also proudly advertises HX Pro Discrete Circuit. I'm not sure where this discrete circuit would be. This down here is all related to something else. It is labeled on the board. So it could be somewhere around there. It could also be uh, somewhere around here, you know, just kind of mixed into uh, that part right there. Since the HX Pro does uh, adjust, it, it's, it's basically a regulator for the bias. The more treble you're recording, the lower it adjusts the bias. That's what the HX Pro does. So it would make sense to have it in here somewhere. Anyway, now let's go ahead and pull out the mechanism. And uh, this thing it should be a fair bit easier than on the Fisher, uh, which is not necessarily because this was uh, built in a better way. It's just because we do have a bit more space to work with. Uh, I'm thinking that if I remove this screw and this screw and then some screws down in here that are going to be a little awkward to reach. There is one there and then another one down there. You can probably see it. Uh, then I should be able to pull out this mechanism, and I'm not entirely sure what the door mechanism is going to do. I think it's just going to stay in place. I ended up taking the cassette deck apart quite a bit further than I initially thought. 
There is the mechanism and the four screws that I pointed out are the ones that hold this in. So you can take it out once you got the four screws removed. I took off the faceplate and I took out the circuit board in the faceplate to take care of a problem that uh, this has and that is the display is dirty. You can kind of see where I went over it with my finger. It's a bit more clear than all around. This got a little hazy so I'm gonna clean this off. Interestingly they stuck the color filter directly onto the display. Not necessarily a good thing to do because uh, well, I hope there is no dirt in between the filter and the display because they only glued it in on the sides. You can actually uh, take it away from the display in the middle. So we'll clean that. The faceplate is now reassembled as you can see as we come in a bit closer. Even with a cassette loaded into it, the door works perfectly fine with a new belt. There it is, new belt in place. I also uh, put some grease onto these gears, make that work a little bit better. I resoldered the fluorescent display connections and I also resoldered the input level potentiometer right there. The original joints looked a bit crappy. Here we have the mechanism close up and one problem is you can't clean this. You can reach down into the air with a Q-tip and clean the heads a little bit, but that's it. The cassette door will come apart. You can take this uh, plastic off, but that only reveals some holes to adjust the heads. You get no uh, space to access the capstans and pinch rollers and the heads during uh, playback or anything like that and you can't even get it to playback if there is no cassette inside. So I was never able to clean up these capstans ever since I got the deck so as you can see these are incredibly dirty both of them. And they're even they're greasy up there and dusty and nasty and got tape residue all over them. The pinch rollers unfortunately don't look too good either. They're kinda cracked not that badly but you can see also on that it was nice and dirty right there so definitely I'll have to clean this while it's out of the unit. The mechanism does have a pretty decent weight to it and got two motors on this got a uh, capstan motor and then for uh, fast forward and rewind we got this motor up there and then we have uh, the two flywheels for the two capstans. Uh, you can kind of see the belt that uh, fell off down there. Then we got another belt connecting this to the motor. Here we have the mechanism taken apart. The smaller one of the two belts is the one that connects the two flywheels together and then the slightly bigger one, you can't even really see it, the slightly bigger one connects the flywheels to the motor. Got the uh, back bearings. These uh, I'm going to put some new grease on there because the stuff that's on there it, it feels like hard butter, so that's probably no good anymore. I took out the capstans and that made cleaning them a lot easier because I could really take them and scrub on them without damaging anything else. I'm now also going to uh, lubricate the capstan bearings. I now have the mechanism back together with the second belt installed running from the flywheel to the motor and this is a bit of a trick. I marked where the original cable ties went holding these uh, wires on there so that I can leave enough of a slack down in there and I don't uh, over tighten this and have the cables too short. I put some new fresh grease into those bearings. I lubricated the motor. I also uh, resoldered the connections going to the motor. This was done in a very very sloppy way originally. Those wires were almost shorting out. 
This is the front of the reassembled mechanism, and when you have the capstans out, it is important to put these washers back on. One there, and one there. These washers keep the oil from moving out of the bearing and onto the capstan, and then onto the tape. And of course, once you got the washers back on, you also want to make sure to clean up the capstans with something that removes oil. Just use lighter fluid. As, uh, as I said, you don't want to have the oil getting onto the pinch rollers or the tape. The mechanism is now back in the cassette deck. Of course, now the question is, is this still going to work? Let's turn it on, see what it does. Turns on. Ah, uh, that sounds good. Okay. Seems to be playing. Seems to be playing fine. Seems to run a little loud. We'll have to see. So let me just quickly go over the things that I did. Now first of all, I checked the mechanism, made sure that's all working fine, which it is. So our belt replacement procedure was entirely successful. As you can see, we now have a fuse. Nice little 500 milliampere primary fuse. I was even able to make use of some existing connections on the circuit board to install that. I then went ahead and did some adjustments. Uh, first of all, uh, the speed. As you may be able to see, I have my uh, test tone tape running in there. On this deck, it's once again this uh, flimsy little screw inside the motor, and I actually had to go searching for a screwdriver that was able to uh, get into there because this is a very very small hole finally found one and as you can see on the scope we're pretty close the service manual says a thousand hertz plus minus seven hertz well might still be a little fast but I don't like messing around with these adjustment screws I always have a feeling that they might break uh, anyway um, so that was the first thing that I adjusted the other thing that I adjusted uh, there was always a problem with this deck, and that was the Dolby didn't sound quite right. It was always kind of muffled. Now, experimenting around, I did knew that uh, the playback gain has an influence on the performance of the Dolby. And the louder I turned the output signal, or the, uh, the playback gain, the better it started to sound. So I referred to the manual, the service manual, and it said you should run a test tape of a certain variety, which of course I don't have. Just ran my test tape and oh well, it seemed to be close enough. Uh, the aim is to have the level meter go up to the Dolby symbol in the display. And as you can see that's definitely the case, right there. And then you can check the output of the cassette deck and you can adjust these two regulators to 700, oops, actually a little high now, uh, 720 millivolts RMS. So I did that. I guess I'll have to go over that once again. But I did that and I um, actually had to uh, adjust these regulators quite a bit higher than they initially were set. So maybe we also fixed the, uh, the not so great Dolby performance of this deck. Anyway, I'm now pretty much done. All that's left to do is cleaning the knobs while I'm at it, and then to put the cover back on. So thank you for watching, and see you again soon.